Uh, my 13-year-old daughter, before I start, my 13-year-old daughter likes to tell me that engineers aren't boring people. They're just uh, people who are excited by boring things. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, 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 I hope this is an exciting presentation, but if not, at least the room's full of engineers. On November 2nd, 2007, a four-ship formation of F-15s took off out of Lambert Field just outside of St. Louis. What you're looking at is, the, is the, about 22 minutes into that mission. In the center is a radar reconstruction of the airplane as, as they were dogfighting. In the upper right is the airplane that we're looking at, MiG-2, that we're interested in. Bottom right is MiG-2's HUD, what he's seeing from the cockpit. And the lower portion in the lower left are his gauges. I'll let the pilots take it from here. Eject, eject! To eject! In the arms, knock it off, knock it off! Mick 3, copy, knock it off. Mick 3, knock it off. 3 and 4, safe it up, climb high. Mick 2's airplane just broke in half. Mick 2, eject, eject! I really. That every time I watch that video, it gets to me. You can hear the anguish in the pilots' voices. I think it serves as a very powerful reminder of why we do what we do. The aircraft did indeed break up in midair, and fortunately, despite the spectacular nature of the mishap, the pilot ejected safely. He had a, he had a shattered humerus, he got hit on the head pretty good, and he was in the chair from about 18,000 feet down, so it was a long ride, but he made it safe. This is what the mishap site looked like. Fall, out just outside of St. Louis in Boss, Missouri. You can see the colors changing. This is the aft fuselage. Five days after the actual event, the safety center called my team and requested assistance in the accident investigation. There I am on site. Uh, just so you know, safety orange is not the new attire in accident investigator wear. It's, uh, it was hunting season in Boss, Missouri. <laughs> and uh, the first thing we wanted to do was not get shot by some wayward hunter. Uh, we worked with a team of guys from the program office and the safety center. We were on site for about a week, and we did what accident investigators do. We assessed the evidence. First, the physical evidence. We walked the scene. We looked, we looked to see what condition was it in. Where was it located? You know, the aft fuselage was a quarter mile away from the forward fuselage. Pretty good indication the plane actually did break up in midair. Then we talked to the witnesses. And witness testimony is a funny thing. You have to take it with a grain of salt. You can always, and I mean always, find someone who saw the airplane catch on fire in midair. It happens every time. <laughs> so once, once we assessed the condition of the evidence, both the physical evidence and the witness testimony, we kind of married it together, we came up with a set of hypotheses. Based on those hypotheses, we took about 12 components back to the lab, and that's when the real work started. I spent about 14 days analyzing those 12 components, 10, 12-hour days, and the funny thing is, after all that work, all I got out of it was blurry vision from looking through a microscope for that much time. Because none of those parts were the cause of the mishap. Every single one of our hypotheses was wrong. Carrie Ann mentioned CSI, and I know you never get to see that part of the job on shows like CSI. Fortunately, investigators back at the site were looking at the wreckage that we left behind, the stuff we didn't think was important. And after about 20 days of analysis, they found a fatigue crack. Now, for those of you who don't know what fatigue is, think about breaking a paper clip. You don't just pull it apart, you're not strong enough, you don't have the grip strength, so what do you do? You straighten it out, you bend it back and forth about 20, 25 times, and eventually it breaks in half. That's fatigue. Everything in the whole wide world fatigues, even airplanes. The key to it is knowing where it's gonna fatigue and managing it. In this case, we had a fatigue crack that happened in a place where we weren't supposed to have it. And for a failure analyst, that's like finding a pirate treasure map with a big red X on it because now we knew exactly where the failure had started. So the where is one part of the question, but the next question is why. Why did we have it there? Turns out the answer to why was pretty simple. The part behind me, the right-hand canopy sill launcher on, wasn't made right. Everything in the green box has something wrong with it. Okay? The caps are too thin. There was significant over-machining in each of those pockets. The surface roughness was too high. 
And just to, you know, the cherry on top, somebody at the factory took a Dremel tool and just went willy-nilly on this part, left all sorts of scratches on it. So we found the why, manufacturing defects. The red box shows the actual failure location of the part, and that fragment at the bottom is what we took back for laboratory analysis. Now the failure crack, the one that caused the plane to break in half, is on the right side of that fragment. But you'll note conveniently circled in red is what looks like another crack. Well, I opened that crack up, and I found it was also a fatigue crack, another fatigue crack growing from another manufacturing flaw. When I found that, I immediately called the chief engineer of the F-15 program office, and I don't remember much about that day, but this conversation is seared into my memory for the rest of my life. It went something like this. Uh, hey, Randy, I opened that second crack, and I'm gonna, I can confirm it's fatigue. And he said, you know what you're telling me? You're telling me I've got to ground the fleet. At that point, my heart kind of jumped into my throat. I realized the gravity of the situation, and despite all my urges to take my ball and go home, I stood my ground and I said, Randy, I'm telling you you've got fatigue. If that means you've got to ground the fleet, then that's what you've got to do. And that's exactly what he did. And frankly, he had no other choice. To put it in perspective, think about it this way. We had, manu we had fatigue cracks growing from manufacturing flaws in spots we didn't expect. We had a part full of manufacturing flaws, and we had those parts all, all over the jet. Imagine if I told you on your car, which has six or 7,000 fasteners on it, that one of those fasteners is loose. And if it falls out, your car's going to explode. <laughs> My guess is you'd probably get a taxi home or ride with one of the friends that you, that you came with. <laughs> or if you really didn't like somebody, you might sell them the car. But I'm assuming you're not, <laughs> I'm assuming you're not that kind of person. So your only real choice is to go through every nut and bolt and make sure they're all tight. Now, imagine you had a rental car company and you had 450 of those cars with the, if it's loose, it's gonna cause your car to explode faster. You couldn't rent those cars until you could assure they were safe and you can't do your job. You can't make money renting cars until you check every fastener on those 450 assets. That's exactly where we were. We had 450-ish aircraft that we couldn't fly because we couldn't assure that they were safe and we couldn't do our job. This was also in the middle of a war. So my team worked with the program office and we assessed the kind of, we talked about the kind of inspections we could do. What kind of defects are we looking for? What's the importance of those defects? We came up with an inspection plan. We implemented that throughout the fleet and we found over 100 other F-15s with significant manufacturing flaws in that inspection including nine that had actively growing fatigue cracks. One of those fatigue cracks, we analyzed them all back in the lab, one of those fatigue cracks was so long that jet likely would have failed in the next several flights. Because of the efforts of my team and the program office guys that were working with us, that, never, that failure never happened. And we worked really hard to figure out the why of that crack, why that happened. And because of that, we were able to repair five jets, put them back into service, and changed the entire way we manage the F-15 fleet. And to date, there have been no reoccurrences of F-15s breaking apart in flight, and hopefully that's the way it stays for, the, for a really long time. Now, that's a, I think that's a cool story. It kind of it describes what my group does. It does it in a nutshell. But my group's ex real mission is failure prevention. And the fact here is there was a mishap. So at some level, my group failed. Now, I don't want to claim 100% of the failure because that part was made when I was eight years old and it was made in California and I was living in Michigan. <laughs> but, at, but at some point, we have to own the fact that we didn't prevent the mishap. So I'm not going to leave here talking even about a partial failure. Let me talk to you about a better story, a plane crash that never happened. In 2011, two pilots are doing a standard training mission in a T-6, which is the Air Force's primary trainer. If you're not familiar with the aircraft, it's a, it's a turboprop with a two-pilot front and back arrangement. During the mission, pilots are flying along, and the instructor pilot control stick breaks off in his hand. Flying. I don't have a cool video, but I, you can probably imagine it was not a good day for the pilot. I don't think it was a Three Stooges thing where he, he gave it to the guy in front, but it was, <laughs> it was, it was not a good day. Now. You might be thinking, much like I was, oh, big deal. There's two seats, there's two control sticks. I know it's the student pilot still flying, but unless he's really, really bad, they ought to at least be able to safely land the aircraft. Well, 
The T6 has a unique control system that requires both control sticks to be mounted to the center shaft. When one control stick broke, they became decoupled. That's a fancy way of saying neither pilot was flying the aircraft. One guy had pitch, one guy had roll, but neither guy had both. Now the pilots did what the pilots are trained to do, right? They're calm and cool under pressure. They, they were flying the jet. They started figuring out who had what authority. They started coordinating their inputs. They practiced landing five times, and on the sixth time, they landed the jet successfully. No issues. Okay, the result of that particular incident was a Class E mishap, which is our least serious aviation category. But if there was an inopportune crosswind, if there was bad weather, we would have lost the jet, and we could have very easily lost both pilots. It would have been on the cover of Aviation Week, it would have been all over the news, it would have been a serious, serious issue that we got all sorts of pressure to fix. The program office and my team knew that was a, kind of, that was a serious possibility, a real possibility, and we immediately worked to solve the problem. The first thing we did, oops, the first thing we did was the material CSI. Let's look at the part that broke. So this is the control stick in the T6. Highlighted in the red box is what we, can call, is what we call the control stick lever arm. Okay, it's in, under the floor, it's an aluminum piece, and circled in red was the location of the crack that broke that lever, the reason the pilot's control stick broke off in his hand. We analyzed that and we looked at that and immediately we did three things. We went on three paths simultaneously. First, we developed an inspection procedure to look at the rest of the fleet. We needed to know how, import, how widespread this was. Second, when those assets came back from the fleet, we did the material CSI on them to figure out what was making those cracks grow. And third, there were some real weird design features on this particular part. So we conducted a manufacturing review to figure out why those were there. First step was that inspection. And when we got back from the ins inspection, scared everybody. Several dozen more jets had actively growing cracks in the those control sticks. One shown behind me, glowing in green and circled in red so you guys can see it. You might notice the blue arrow. The blue arrow is pointing to an extremely sharp corner on that control stick lever arm. Now anybody with about, I don't know, six months of airplane design experience can tell you that sharp corners in airplanes don't get along very well. That sharp corner is not a good idea. During the man re manufacturing review, we found that a design error, a, a simple computer error, had led to that sharp corner. That error was compounded by the manufacturing instructions, which made the inspections for the cracks ineffective and caused guys you know, minimum wage guys with knife edge files to grind in that corner to try to get rid of some machining marks. And all they did was make the matters worse. As if it couldn't get bad enough, when we did the material CSI, the forensic analysis, what we found is those cracks were being driven not just from fatigue, like we talked about with the F-15, but also from overload. That meant we had two completely different things making these parts break. Our job was pretty tough at that point. We had to figure out how many drivers we had, what's causing, the cra what's causing these cracks, and we had to come up with one solution that would fix every problem that existed on the jet. To do that, we worked with, with, with other organizations within an AFRL, we developed an instrumentation package, we took it out to the field, and we instrumented 100 T6s over the course of several days to find the stresses on that control stick lever arm. When we did that, we recommended a material and a geometry change, one solution to solve all the problems. Based on our recommendations, the OEM redesigned the part. You can see the old and the new part shown behind me. You can pretty clearly, hopefully, see the differences in the thicknesses and the differences in those corners. My team tested the redesign. It was four times stiffer and lasts at least 5,000 times longer in service. I say five, at least 5,000 because, frankly, we just got sick of testing it, and we just couldn't cause it to break. Good news for the pilots and the, and the, and the aircraft designers, this was completely weight neutral. It didn't gain a single ounce. Now, if you've ever worked a technical issue like this, you know a lot of times the technical part's the easy part. We kept with the program, we kept constant, you know, we kept in constant contact with the program office to sell this to upper management, and eventually it was bought off. We're currently 80% of the way through retrofitting both the Air Force and the Navy fleets, and to date, there's not been a single instance of, a single reoccurrence of control stick lever crack just like the F-15. But this one's a little bit different. 
You see, my organization, we work on about 50 projects like this every year, and we almost never get to see how good our solutions are. Because what we do is we assess the data, we make a recommendation, and it either gets implemented or it doesn't. We don't get to run the experiment with a control group of, of both options. But in this case, we had a control group. You see, there's a several foreign air forces fly the T-6 as well. And they had the control stick lever arm cracking problem too. Now, we weren't hiding anything from them. We kept them abreast of our investigation as we were doing it. We talked to them about the redesign, but they, did, in the end, decided the redesign was too expensive. And they took the OEM recommended quick fix of basically sanding the cracks away. They did it on all their jets, and they inspected six months later, and they had a 70% reoccurrence rating in those control stick lever cracks. So I take a tremendous amount of pride in what my team did. You know, for those of you who deal with complex systems, the answer from engineers is all too frequently it depends. And we lose sight of the fact that there's very often right and wrong still. In this case, my team came up with the right answer. Again, I take a tremendous amount of pride in the fact that my team can provide the best engineering support possible to our Air Force Airmen. That's it. The total cost of this retrofit was $4.3 million, which is significantly less than the cost of one T6, not to mention the pilots. Now, as I get off the stage, you know, I didn't get up here to brag about having a job I like. I really do like my job, and no offense to the pilots in the audience who I'm sure will wrestle me for it, but I think I have the best job in the Air Force. <laughs> but I know it's not for everyone, okay? The takeaway I'd like to give the audience is that no matter what you do, the Air Force is counting on you to make a difference. You are all DOD research scientists. You're freaking comic book characters, right? You're like, the, like Q and James Bond or the dude who makes Batman stuff. You really make the stuff that support heroes and you are critical to the continued success of the Air Force. I don't care how far you look through in history, whatever technological change there's been, whether it's the Industrial Revolution or the Nano this or Bio that, at the heart of any technological change have always been dedicated, competent, motivated, passionate scientists and, scientists and engineers who want to make a difference. The only reason I got up here was to give you an example of how a small team of engineers that fit that mold can make a difference. I know that through the contributions, my contributions and the contributions of my team, lives have been saved and crises have been averted. There are people walking around right now alive because of my team and they probably don't even know it. That makes me pretty proud. Everyone here has that same ability to make a difference and do something that absolutely matters. The Air Force Research Lab gives you everything you need and is challenging you to go out and change the world. You just have to be up for that challenge. Thank you.